Early nominating contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN is the place for political campaign enthusiasts, with unfiltered coverage surrounding the early primaries and caucuses, as well as speeches from key battleground states. Whether you're interested in your state's race or want to follow all of the political events, you can get immediate access to what the candidates are saying, plus nominating results in real time with a free mobile app. C-SPAN now or watch live on the C-SPAN networks. In 2005, two brothers hit the road to chase demons and fight monsters. After 15 years, they made television history and built a community of dedicated and lasting fans. I'm Rob Benedict. I played God, a.k.a. Chuck Shirley. And I'm Richard Spate Jr., and I played the Archangel Gabriel, a.k.a. the Trickster, a.k.a. Loki. And in later years, I stepped behind the camera to direct a bunch of episodes. Though we've been involved with the series for years and multiple seasons, we never sat down and watched the entire show. Until now. Rob and I are going episode by episode, watching each and every one. And we're diving in with the folks who made the show to bring you an insider's point of view and some great behind-the-scenes stories from the writers, producers, crew, and actors. And along the road, we're becoming fans. We've heard you saying it for years, and we finally get what all the excitement is about. We'll definitely be hitting on some spoilers, so you better be watching with us or look out. This show holds up after all this time and deserves to be watched and rewatched. Thank you for joining our journey and listening to Supernatural Then and Now. Hey, everybody, it's Rob Benedict. Richard Spade Jr. right here and your co-pilot for the episode. And we are talking about season four, episode three, In the Beginning. In the beginning, which ironically is not the beginning of the of the show, it's uh, no. it's episode uh, three of season four. No, it's, it should be called in the middle. That's true, or in the first third. Well, we're we're off to a great start here at season four. If if you're new to the podcast or you're returning after taking a break, thanks for listening, and be sure to stick around. Season four is going to be. It's going to be our best season yet. I'm super excited about this season. Yeah, you're, you're going to look back at season one, two, and three and go, what were those turds? This is a season. You know what <laughs> now I mean? Now this is a season. The, the, the guys finally got their head out of their pooper, and they're making a podcast. That's what you're going to say to yourself. Or maybe you're going to say it out loud to neighbors and friends. Whatever. It's true. Wow. Let's get into it. Big episode here. It's season four, episode three. So much unpacked. But before we start unpacking it, Robbie, why don't you do that off-the-cuff summary you're so good at? Okay, let me think. All right, Sam meets up with Ruby to do some secret stuff. End of episode. <laughs> no, end of Sam. <laughs> uh, yeah, I kept thinking, like, uh, get married already, the two of them. Jeez. Castiel visits Dean and tells him he has to stop it. And with a tap on Dean's forehead, Castiel sends him back to 1973 Lawrence, Kansas. At first, Dean is confused about where he is, but he quickly figures it out and is shocked to find himself sitting at a diner next to a young John Winchester. Dreamboat. Yeah, dreamboat. A dreamboat of a father at a young age. Dean follows John. He convinces him to buy the Impala rather than a VW van, and Dean sees Mary as a young woman. She confronts him, and Dean discovers that she's a hunter. Dean follows her home and meets her parents, his grandparents, Samuel and Deanna Campbell, and learns that they are hunters too. It's a whole family of hunters. He's shocked and lets them know he's a hunter too, but doesn't let on that he's from the future. Sam is working on a case, and Dean wonders if it might have something to do with why Castiel sent him here. Right. Are you confused? Yes. Good. The next day, Samuel and Mary go to interview the wife of a man who died under mysterious circumstances. They are shocked to learn that Dean is there first, posing as a young priest. Wow. The same as Samuel. They're both priests. Oh, my God. A couple of priests. Mary's able to have a conversation with the widow's son. He tells them a story of making a deal with a man with yellow eyes. Oh, a jaundiced fellow with cirrhosis of the liver. That or the yellow-eyed demon. Oh. Dean knows that this is the yellow-eyed demon. (laughs) That puts the guessing out of that one. (laughs) Samuel and Mary haven't heard of this type of demon. Dean makes a quick side trip to Colorado to get the cult. He also has John's journal. (laughs) A quick side trip to Colorado. Yeah, which is a good day-long trip. (laughs) Yeah. Day-long drive in that car that he's driving. He also has John's journal, which has the dates and locations of incidents involving yellow eyes. One is happening the next day to a young woman that Mary knows. 
Mary and Samuel go to try to save her friend, but they are too late. The girl has made a deal with Azazel. Azazel. However, Azazel takes a liking to Mary. Dean arrives with the cult, but Azazel escapes. Back at the Campbell's house, Dean comes clean with Samuel and explains that he is Mary's son and they need to kill Azazel to save Mary's life. Samuel tries to take the colt, and Dean realizes that Azazel has possessed his grandfather. Oh, no. Yeah. Azazel reveals that he's building an army with his blood. He's making deals to come back in 10 years to seed his blood in children. Ugh. Yeah. Gross. Deanna gets killed. That was a real, just side note, De- Grandma gets killed and been nothing? Well, they spent all their money on Mitch Pileggi, so they basically had got a, a background artist to play the grandma. She had no dialogue. We never got to know her. No. She made one she... move to help the kids, and El Snapo, he, he, he broke her neck. Yeah. Well, anyway, Azazel stabs himself in the stomach to ensure that Samuel will eventually die. Meanwhile, John and Mary are sharing a romantic moment, but are interrupted by Azazel slash Samuel. John gets killed. Mary makes a deal sealed with a really gross kiss. Or some might say romantic kiss. Yeah, I mean, you know, I tell you, a lot of people in the fan world love to get love to get their uh, their lips around that uh, Mitch Pileggi. You know what I'm saying? They have Pileggi lips. Oh, Pileggi lips, they call them. <laughs> <laughs> so she makes the deal with Azazel to save John. Dean wakes up in the present. Castiel explains that he was only sent back to see the truth. He needs to stop whatever dark path Sam is on. Even the angels don't know what Azazel's bigger plan was. Wow, that's I. I thought I understood the episode. Now reading that summary, I don't. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> I'm more confused now. I don't know if I should be I offended was. or if. Okay, uh, I'll go first. I loved this episode. There, there, it just as a fan of this show that I'm now watching. So much was revealed here. There's just a lot to unpack in terms of. We can talk about how great the the episode is. We can talk how great. Matt Cohen and Amy Gumenick and Mitch Pileggi are, but also just the, uh, for me, it was a big shocker that Mary is a hunter and we knew that this early. For some reason in my mind, I felt like we didn't know that until Sam Smith re- reappears at the end of season 11. I didn't realize that we knew this early that she was a badass. I, and, I didn't either. And it explains what this sort of hint that we got a couple seasons ago with yellow eyes and her on the ceiling and that she knew he was coming. You know what I mean? That there was that, now it all kind of makes sense. Yeah, man, it does. And it's so weird. Yeah. Um, and uh, my only disappointment really was that we didn't find out enough about grandma. I, I really, I thought that at some point she was going to actually be some kind of demon or something. Cause, cause Dean, when he's like, this is, she's like, this is my dad, Samuel and my, and his, my mom, Deanna. And he's like, like, he'd never heard of her. So I thought maybe there was something in that, like that was some mis- mystery, but maybe I not. wondered about, he does say that with certain weight to it. Yeah, like he I, didn't, he never heard that name. Do you think it's because like, oh my gosh, I've always heard her spoken of, I've never seen her, like, oh. Tristan. Yeah, maybe because because she died long before he was born, I don't know. But it looks like grandpa died too, so true. I don't know. True, 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 true. Um, but uh, anyway, but besides that, I loved it. I loved the Back to the Future elements. Yeah, that was cool. There was so much uh, answered here for me because uh, as 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 much as I love Matt and Amy, I'd never watched this episode before. So it was uh, it's really it was really fun to see. The period piece element was awesome. I mean, really yeah. well executed. Yeah. Um, being set in the seventies and all, and all those jokes about the seventies, like hey, you know, Sonny and Cher broke up or whatever. You know, they were, those were all super funny. Super funny. Uh, Amy and Matt are great in these roles, and they just are. I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's a packed house of great talent. When you when you factor in Mitch, Amy, and Matt, Matt Cohen, Amy Gumenick, Mitch Pileggi, it's just so good. And, it's just a classic. Yeah. And that was interesting that it was just focusing on one guy so much, one one brother. I don't think I, I don't recall an episode that has so little of one of the other guys. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this, Jared gets in a car, drives off. That's all we see of him, of yeah. Sam. Yeah. And and I don't think we've seen an episode that favors one brother that heavily. Usually the final act, the other brother comes and gets involved or whatever happens. And yeah. that never never played out. It was yeah. it was really interesting. Um, and the, and the the relationship that Dean has with Castiel at this point I think is kind of cool just cuz no one else is seeing Castiel but him. Yep. 
And Castiel is still kind of mysterious and a little bit threatening. You know, there's a little bit of like, don't test me. I could send you back right. to hell. Right. I like that. I like that as well. I thought it was um, a beautiful scene with uh, Jensen and Amy when Jensen's going, hey, uh, on October 3rd, 1982, yeah. don't get out of bed. It's a beautiful scene. It's so well done. It's fucking tears. Every time he sheds tears, I I, I, I tear up a little bit. I like think it's, Ackles knows how to deliver in a big way every time. And, yeah. uh, and Amy was a great recipient for that moment. It was really. Yep. Yep. Really well done. Yeah, and uh, another thing I was going to note that was kind of funny is, uh, you know, we're back in time in the 70s, and then when he wakes up, you see uh, Jared as Sam's legs walk by, and he's wearing these big bell-bottom jeans because that was the fashion in the aughts at that time. With right. The, the boot-cut jeans. And I thought, are we still in the 70s? <laughs> That's hilarious. What's happening here? Yeah, no, you could kind of do a slow uh, tilt up to Jared and go the pants and then his hair and just yeah, assume he's, he's still oh yeah. he's still 1976 exactly great episode R- yeah. really fun where are you gonna where are you gonna go in the beard rating here buddy you know you sent me something the other day which was a picture of uh there's someone we follow on twitter that's super funny and has pictures from the 70s uh and 80s with really funny captions uh are you looking it up no no i know you're i know uh, what you're talking about though this is the uh, the the kenny loggins one right yeah, and so, so it's Kenny Loggins, but it, it referenced Kenny Loggins as Jesus. So I'm going to, because he looks like Jesus, <laughs> it talks about Kenny Loggins was was carrying you on the beach or something like that. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll find it right here because I'll read the quote because it's funny. It's going to be my text chain to you, so it's easy enough to find. It's a it's a glorious picture of, um, of Kip, Mr. Loggins, Kenny Loggins, from the 70s with the full-on Vaseline, uh, you know, glowy filter on it. And the and the wording is and the wording is God. I send you a lot of these. Yeah, you send <laughs> Holy a lot. Smokes, of them. I really send you a lot. Yeah, you re- you really do. They're so funny. It is the wording is during your times of trial and suffering, when you only see one set of footprints in the sand. It was then that I was recording Footloose. <laughs> little little, <laughs> little play on the old footprints in the sand. So I'm going to give it a Kenny Loggins as Jesus. All right, nice. And I'll give it. Um, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess, in, in keeping it biblical, I'll go uh, Charlton Heston as Moses. There you go. <laughs> so there the beard, you go. The 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 fake beard of Charlton Heston. <laughs> exactly. But uh, it basically, I'm giving I'm giving it a great review because it's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, fantastic. Well, we have such a treat. Uh, our guests today, uh, Amy Gumanick and Matt Cohen. Amy Gumanick, you know her as the original young Mary Winchester. She also has had a big role in the CW series Arrow. She's had a ton of guest spots on shows like NCIS, CSI, Grimm, Bones, and Castle. And she's also been in such films as Bird Box and The Binding. And Matt Cohen, our good friend. Well, of course, you know him as young John Winchester, the original young John Winchester, and the angel Michael. He's also had large parts in General Hospital and Criminal Minds. He's also... One of our favorite reporters from Entertainment Tonight on the red carpet, getting the scoop from Hollywood's biggest stars. And he stars in the upcoming TV movie from Hallmark, Made for Each Other. He's a hell of a karaoke host. Ladies and gentlemen, our pals, Amy Gumenick and Matt Cohen. Thank you both for peeling out time from your busy schedules to do this. Um... I don't know how much, if you've paid attention at all, Lord knows I don't pay attention to anything, but Rob and I have been doing this rewatch podcast of the of the show, starting in episode one, and it's been really fun, man, because honestly, Jay, Rob and I hadn't watched Jack crap when it came to Supernatural. I'd seen a handful of episodes, and so it's been really fun to sort of watch everybody's journey, and I think <laughs> Rob and I always comment like, oh, that's why people know that quote, or oh, hey, that's that photograph that's always <laughs> yeah. posted on the wall, you know? And to that end, uh, as well as I know both of you, and as much as I've seen clips, I've never sat down and watched this episode. L- yesterday was the first time I'd ever seen this episode, and it's such a great episode. It's packed, packed with stuff. In my mind, it was like, oh, somehow they go back in time and they meet their parents when they're younger, but there's so much more going on. First of all, I didn't realize that Mary was a hunter and that was something that we knew that this early in the show. I had no idea. When you show up and you kick his ass in the like alley or whatever, I like I was so I was so blown away by that. So uh Amy with the like did was that like a did you have to learn the choreography of that fight? Was that a whole thing? Yes. It was 
I when after I was cast in the role, I got a call um, from the director who sort of gave me a very like briefed me. Matt, I think we maybe have talked about this. Initially auditioning, they they were fake names, fake sides, had no idea that we were going to be young or that I was going to be young and married, um, which I think was a good thing because I would have been so much more nervous had I known sort of the shoes and legacy that I was stepping into. And so after I was cast, I got a call asking about like if I had any fight training or stage combat. And I did. And I think because I had done some you know, like basic theatrical stage combat, hand to hand kind of things. The conversation shifted a little bit to like, well, how much do you want to do? Which of course I was like, I want to do everything as much as you'll let me. So before flying out to Vancouver to film, I worked with fight choreographer here in LA. Um, and we had a few sessions less about learning the choreography, but more just like the basic here, are like the 10 moves that you need to feel confident doing. Um, and then when I got to set and worked with the stunt team there, um, I mean, it really was like learning a dance. It's so yeah. fun. And coming from a dance yeah. background, I sort of saw it as like choreography. A question. So with the fight choreography, the fight training you did in Los Angeles, was that provided by the studio? Was that something you did on your own? What was what was that? It was it was provided by the studio, which is the one and only time I've had that experience. Yeah, dude. That I've never even heard wow. of that. That's fantastic. Well, they, they asked me if I would be interested. I was like, All right, does anyone say no? And that was Steve Boyum. Am, am yeah. I correct? Yeah, Boyum. Who, yeah, yeah. he directed it. Yeah. Guy, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And both of you, it also struck me watching this, that both of you, I totally buy the both of you as a young Jeffrey D. Morgan and a young Sam Smith. Did did the two of you watch earlier episodes to sort of try to get their gestures down and that kind of thing? Amy? I was going to say Matt. <laughs> uh, I mean... Or was it just luck and you, you know? I think it was both. Just just... I think for the casting, it was luck. Um, Cause like I said, I, I didn't know. Although I had an inkling cause I remember walking into my audition and it was one of my very first auditions out of college. So really one of my first professional auditions ever. I had no idea what I was doing. And I wow. do, in retrospect, I remembered seeing there, they had um, a, like a headshot of both Sam and Jeffrey D. Morgan taped up to the like, behind the computer and I didn't realize it at the time but then after I was like oh that's why they were there and so I think from a casting standpoint it was more that they were looking for people that sort of had a natural essence or some something like them Um, but yes once I was cast I then went back and tried to find every moment of Sam's Mary um, just to get more just to get familiar with her mannerisms and like her vibe. But then when I got to set, Steve, the first thing I remember he came into, I was doing a costume fitting and Steve Boyne, the director came in and said, we just want you to know, we want to see a different John and Mary. So relieve yourself of any sort of stress or pressure to play what they have already established, um, which I I so appreciated. So yes, I did my homework, yeah. but then was very grateful that he was like, okay, now you can just throw it away. Do your own, yeah. right. do your own thing. Yeah. What about you, man? Wow. Steve Boyum never came to me and offered me any <laughs> comfort at all <laughs> whatsoever. I, um, you know, I, I watched Jeffrey Dean Morgan in, uh, what's it called? The doctor show Grey's Anatomy. He played this. Sure. Yeah. He played this great character called Denny, who you just fall in love with in the bed. He's just, you know, I mean, you fall in love with Jeffrey, even when he's Negan, he's playing this atrocious character on Walking Dead. You, this yeah. guy's, re- he's really got something. So like, I just hope that I could have any part of that. I knew I wasn't going to be able to fill the shoes of Jeffrey D. Morgan. I assumed that they wanted, you know, something its own because it's kind of, you know, a predecessor to what Jeffrey Jeffrey did as the boy's father. And so I thought, oh, if I could have a little, you know, that that young, earnest, you know, naive kind of take on the world. And in addition, make people like me, like you like Denny when you watch him on Grey's Anatomy, then I would be good. Little did I know I walked in Robert Ulrich's office and like he was like with a picture. He was like, God, I hope you're good. All right. Really? That, so uh, just, <laughs> yep, that's exactly what he said. He said, God. Okay. So just good. for people who are listening Damn to it. this and they couldn't see Matt's uh, acting it out. Which is everybody. Yeah. Basically, you're holding up Robert Ulrich, who was the casting director, was holding up a picture of Jeffrey Dean Morgan and then looking at the picture and then looking at you, looking at the picture, and looking at you oh. going, okay, it's a match. <laughs> that's great. Wow. Wow. And so I read it and then uh, they brought me back for a callback and, and, 
where Kripke was in the office and a, a little six degrees of separation. The very first movie I ever did uh, in Hollywood was called Boogeyman 2, produced by none other than Steve Hine, who is our, our fantastic producer of this right. podcast. Um, and at the time, Eric Kripke had written characters or co-wrote or did some writing on Boogeyman 2. So when I walked in to, for the callback, it was Robert Ulrich and Eric Kripke. And Kripke goes, hey, Matt. And I was like, oh, hey, buddy. Nice to see you. And I was like, who is this guy that I don't remember? And the, the Hollywood actor thing to do always is to say, nice to see you, because you're not really lying or telling the truth. So we say nice to see you. Um, which is terrible. So if <laughs> yeah, you guys totally. hear that from somebody, just know they don't remember you. So hey, Rob, nice to see <laughs> um, you. <ya. laughs> uh, thanks, Rich. Rich, real quick, uh, Big Man One or Two, which is your fave? Man, I tell you, I love dancing so much that all the boogie movies to me were just uh, <laughs> just a fun <laughs> rollick. Uh, so in this episode, it's a it's a unique episode because Sam is only in one scene. Did you guys meet Jared at all when you did this episode? I want to just say this. I had no idea about anything. Amy and I sat down for a table read and Jared and Jensen walked in and Jensen was like, hey, my name's Jensen Ackles. And then Jared came in like a big moose and headlights as he is. And he was like, hey, I'm Jared. And then he goes, Padalecki, like James, James Bond, but he did it with Jared Padalecki, oh, wow. which didn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue the same way. And you look at him and you're like, nice to meet you, Mr. P Jared is cool. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm Matt. Uh, I hope you don't out alpha me out of this room because I, I feel like a little boy in your presence. <laughs> That's hilarious. Wow. It's, it's table reads. You guys did table reads. Yep. Did you ever do a table read, Rob, on this on Supernatural? No, yeah. never. That on my first my first episode. They never did one. ever. Did you, Amy? Do you remember the table read experience? Now that Matt's talking about it, but I had completely forgotten. It was a that very fast moment. They took us in the director's room. You know, the the room yeah. up there, Rich, on the second floor there. That they, you know, everybody does their meetings or their yeah, phone the conference calls. room, whatever. Yeah, the conference room, and it, and it was just me and Amy, and I think maybe it was just the director and Jared and Jensen showed up. I don't think it was anybody yeah, else. I think I think it was their lunch break, if I remember correctly. I, I had like a vague memory of them eating while we were mm, eating. Yeah, maybe. that makes sense. And they were they were sure. probably most worried that I couldn't pull it off, so they wanted us to just hear it out loud once before we got on the set. Um, wow, that's that's kind of what's cool. Like. But you, I tell you what, I mean, Amy got fight training in Los Angeles. She had Steve Boyum giving her some like sage advice and a table read. Let's Point be honest, is. this was a. Amy really got the red carpet rolled out for this whole experience. Or or they were like, oh, we've like already given this girl so much. She better now be able to perform. <laughs> so it was my final. Piece. I feel like it's the former. Um, so so a Amy, you talked about you're glad you didn't know that you were going into play young Mary Winchester because you would have felt additional pressure. Is that to say that you knew of the show in advance of auditioning for it? No. Um, I mean, I had heard of it, but I had never seen it. I really didn't know much about it at all, other than it was two brothers fighting demons. But once I started researching and going down that rabbit hole, I quickly learned about the world that was supernatural fandom. But even still, I think it really wasn't until filming in the beginning. And Matt, I don't know if you, if you were there for this, but I remember we were in... Uh, I was in the makeup trailer. It was one of the first days on set. And one of the makeup artists had said, made a comment about like, oh, be careful. They're going to get you for conventions. And I had no idea what that meant and thought like, I'm, I'm a guest star. I'm doing one episode. Like, what? I, okay. And it really wasn't until after I did, I guess it was the first episode. And then we did the first convention together. Like I was pretty deep in the process before I realized just how massive and like epic the supernatural world was. Right. Uh, I think it just kept, it kept growing for me. But yeah, no, I had no idea. Interesting. What about you, Matt? Yeah. Were you familiar with the show? And you mentioned ha knowing Jeffrey from other stuff. Did you know the show? Honestly, no, I, I hadn't. I mean, I like Amy, I, you know, I was aware that there was a show on the CW with young, handsome guys on it. And I wasn't on it. Like that's, that's about as much as I knew of the show. And then, you know, you get an audition and of course, like anything, you at least want to hear the theme song to the opening credits of the thing. So you turn that on and then you're like, Oh, I watched the opening. This is a dark show. So I'll just talk. The theme song of this is yeah. right. So immediately, you know, if you're going to act on the show, you can't act with this voice. You 
have to act with this voice because it's deep and mysterious. And so like, that was like my first change was like, oh, I better not come in too high. And then, you know, uh, Hi, then, air then, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you just went from there. I, I don't know. I wasn't familiar with the show and I, and I, and cause I was playing a, the origin, I guess, origin story of a character. I, I didn't feel a lot of pressure to to kind of answer a performance. I just didn't want to screw it up because I had so much respect for what Jeffrey did as as an actor at that point. I, you know, I just I, I don't want to come in and look like a less of an actor trying to play a great, you know, this guy. So that that was it. But I had no idea about the show. But you know, like Amy, once you're in, you're in, right? And it's my my friend circle, my my wife, my travels, everything of the last 15 years of my life. I've been, I mean, I've been married to Mandy 12 years now and you guys knew me when I wasn't married. So that's how long Supernatural has been in my life. And, uh, you know, it's a blessing. I did a podcast the other day. This wonderful girl, Jasmine has this called be yourself podcast. We were talking about things and she asked me, she's like, when, at what age in life did you finally figure out who you were? And I went, you know, it's a good question. I'd probably say I was about 35 years old and I'm 40 now. And it took a lot of being on a stage with nothing to say at Supernatural Convention to find out what you're made of or what you want to talk about or what you find funny. And I found a lot of myself because of Supernatural. I talk about this all the time, but being on a stage in front of thousands of people that like you and you not wanting to just cash that check, you wanting to be there, perform, entertain, fulfill them somehow, leave fulfilled yourself walked me down a line of self-examination and finding out who I was. So I, I got to talk all about this the other day and I'm, I'm, I'm so, so grateful for what it's all the pathways supernaturals led me down and all the doors that it's cracked open and I've been able to kick open or the ones I've peeked in and walked out. It's, it's been such a blessing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think all four of us could say that that's, you never thought at the original audition, well, Three of us that had to audition, one of us, uh, Sir Spate, was given the role. But the rest of us had to audition, and uh, you never thought that one little audition would turn into that we're still talking about it 20 years later, right? Ahoy, Rich Spate here. Hope you're enjoying the episode, but we got to pull over for a second for some messages. Hey, this is Richard Spate. You know what? It's 2024. It's a brand new year. And I bet you made some New Year's resolutions. And I bet one of them was to eat healthier. Well, you can get cranking on that resolution right now, my friend, with Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, the cooking fatigue. I'm getting tired just talking about it. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart this resolution off right. Forget frantic lunch prep and rush dinner making. That stinks. Factors two-minute meals, yes, I said two minutes, are your secret weapon in the new year. You get to fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. It doesn't get any easier than that. And Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what's on the schedule. So I know what you're asking. Rich, how do I tap into this Factor magic? You head to factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 and use code SPNTAN50 to get 50% off. That's a lot off. That's code SPNTAN50 at factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 for 50% off. Make that resolution happen now and make it happen at a discount fantastic food that's healthy and delicious and delivered right to my door. Now that is how you start the new year off right. Early nominating contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN is the place for political campaign enthusiasts with unfiltered coverage surrounding the early primaries and caucuses, as well as speeches from key battleground states. Whether you're interested in your state's race or want to follow all of the political events, you can get immediate access to what the candidates are saying, plus nominating results in real time with a free mobile app. C-SPAN now, 
or watch live on the C-SPAN networks. Thanks for listening. Now back to the episode. Matt, I have to admit, I knew at one point you turn into the Archangel Michael, but I didn't know when. So I'm watching this episode and I'm going, oh, wow. So Michael, so at the end, the big, at the big climax, M- Matt's going to show up and he's going to be this archangel. But that never happened. I was like, oh, okay. That's... So I had, I had to look online like, oh, that's next season. Okay. Yeah, no, Mitch, Mitch Pileggi breaks my neck and then kisses my wife. It gets weird. Yeah. And then I hope for another episode, which ends up coming down the line yeah. in, in season five. But again, it's like you get that script and Rob and Rich, I know we've talked about this so many times. Amy, we I get a script and I'm like, uh, okay, John Winchester, John Winchester. There's a typo in here. They, it seems like they, the name is Michael, but it's supposed to be John. And you're literally confused because you don't know, you know, the real, the the, the history of what this show is because I haven't didn't do my due diligence until this podcast came out. But then at the time you're you're confused and well, there it is. You get to play two amazing guest stars in one episode of TV, which is something you so rarely get to do. And then that could possibly turn into, Rob, your situation, playing the almighty for seasons to come, ending ending a 15-year run with this. Yeah, killing, killing, killing the show. Killing, killing the, show. the show, you know? Before going, going over to Lucifer and killing that show. Rob was uh, just slaughtering yeah. uh, hit shows for a good run. Yeah. Remember when people used to like me? No. What do you think about it? one of the coolest parts of the show? This from, from a sort of design standpoint was the the fact that it was set in the seventies. You know, it being a period piece, like your guys' costumes. Like Amy, your hair alone is worth the conversation. Like it was awesome. I loved it every second. It was like playing professional make believe. And again, it was it was you know one of my like I mentioned one of my first professional jobs, and I remember going into that first fitting just absolutely like little girl in her with her toy chest of costumes dream come true and there was something on that too the um one of the scenes that we filmed we were briefly in the kitchen of our house and i remember opening one of the drawers just like kind of snooping around in between takes and even the silverware was from the 70s and i remember just like ha- my mind was blown like we walked on to set and were just transported into that time period and i always feel like when i'm t- like talking about acting in two actors i feel like our preparation it's like 70% of the work. And then we walk into the set and the costumes, put those shoes on, hair and makeup. Like that for me always sort of finishes the sure. character. Um, and in this this show and this episode in particular, I felt like so much of what I did was influenced by the world that was created around me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. And the, the, the scene where he first meets Matt with the cars outside, that was so... That was great, and the and the car they have Jensen driving in the episode is hilarious. Yeah, the uh, uh, accoutrement. Ah. What about? Hey, listen, we talked about Mitch Pileggi, but we haven't like gone a done a dive into working with him. Hold on, I I want to just point something out to both of you and Rob. You kind of brought it up uh, with the beginning of the episode where where, where I meet um, the Dean at the car lot where I'm about to buy the Volkswagen, but I buy the Impala. But then right before that i think it was just before that the diner scene is a classic nod to marty mcfly yeah exactly it's very back to the future yeah it's i mean and it's funny because i just two nights ago was watching the first back to the future with my son and when the when biff walks in and he goes mcfly and i mean it's it's meant to be a very similar moment you know and and even shot similar and steve boyham i remember on the day going oh we're gonna have our back to the future moment here and i just thought that was so cool because it was back to the future we love michael j Fox or watching him live out this beautiful long life against all odds and everything he's doing. And so I just wanted to bring that up for a second. That's yeah. so spot on. Yeah. Man. So true. No, hundred percent. That's my son's yeah. favorite movie. Uh, and I love that. That's and that scene is great yeah. between the two of you. And I love how kind you are to him. Also, you could be like, you know, get out of here freak. And you're real nice with your, with what, who is your son? You know, actually, everything you in know you wants to play it like, like a, like a Marty and Biff scene, but you couldn't like within the moment, yeah, you couldn't right. figure out who jo- I, I didn't know who John was in that moment. You know, like I, I knew how I wanted to kind yeah. of play it with this guy staring at me and strange and dad and all this stuff. But like, I didn't right. know is like, is he like, is, is John Winchester like, Hey buddy, what are you looking at? Or is, 
or is he more subdued? You know, like, what is he? Because in, that, in the moment you hear that scene and you see Marty in the first movie and then in the second movie where he comes back to defend his dad or, you know, whatever it is. And it was hard to kind of detach yeah. from the biff, uh, the biffness of, of that moment. Well, also, Matt, I think what, what's challenging for you as an actor in this episode is that you're playing someone that we know is a badass, but this is pre-badass. This is before he got that edge. So you go, oh, wow, what would John be like before that, you know, before knowing he had that or that the world yeah, was like Yeah, and that, I don't know if you guys know this, but it was on my radar immediately that I had green eyes and Jeffrey has has like a lighter brown eye. And I thought, well... This is going to be interesting. I guess they're going to put contacts in me. I've never really worn contacts. And they did it. They were like, the show, we shoot dark. Your eyes aren't going to be a big issue. But what is going to be a big issue is that once upon a time, I had my ears pierced and John couldn't possibly uh. have holes in his ears. So they filled the holes in my ears with hot wax and then covered my whole ear in makeup. So it didn't look well, like I ever had pierced what? ears. Wow. Was your hole that big? It wasn't. It was literally at that point, like originally once upon a time, a long time ago, it was, you know, it was a bigger, it was like the size of a pencil, but now, then it, then it was closed up just like a regular earring size, but they were like on screen and your close-ups were still seeing, you know, you're still feeling that it feels like the nineties or two thousands, wow. not the seventies because your ears pierced. And I was like, all right, interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's a trip. Did anybody comment on your, the eye color at a convention? Yeah. Someone surely. Oh, yeah, they did. And you know what my smart ass answer was, is that when you go through the things that John goes through, you just darken everything down to your eye color. Yeah, so good. And end of story, period. No further questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get to the, 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 the burning question that Rich and, 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 and me and everyone wants to know. What was it like kissing Mitch Pileggi? Um, I have to say, <laughs> Mitch is... One of the kindest humans I have ever met. Agreed. Agreed. It, Truly it's is. It's just like from the moment I met him, you know, granted, he was also playing my dad. So there was a very much uh, like father daughter dynamic. Um, I remember <clears throat> meeting him pretty early on. And one of my mentors from college, it was a very, very close friend of his. And so she had sort of, we had never met, but she had talked to, we knew of each other. Right. And so he was, sort of this like iconic teddy bear in my eyes because I had always heard these incredible things about him. I had seen his work, I had so much respect for him. And meeting him, he just is like just so kind. Yeah. So down to earth and so like comforting. He just like, I don't know, I just felt like, so calm in his presence. So it's funny when when yeah that scene came up, I think it could have been really awkward. And he just made it so comfortable. Like he was so you know, he, he also was so considerate in such sweet ways. Like he always made sure he had gum before and he would like, you know, made sure that I was okay with his like scruff, his facial hair. Like he was very Aww. sensitive about the whole thing, which was very sweet. That's really sweet. I mean, he's a, a, yeah. a, in on that show, even for that time, he was a, I mean, he would have been the biggest fish on that show. You know, yeah. as long as yeah. Jensen had been on TV at that time, it was a drop in the bucket compared to Mitch who'd been on, you, you know, X-Files forever. X -Files. So he's, he, you know, he was such a cool addition to the show. Like, what a cool what a guy to play that role. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's so He's good. so good. He good is actor. so good in that role. And yeah. as soon as you you go back and we meet your dad, and it's Mitch Pileggi, even though I know it's Mitch, I'm like, oh! You know, it's 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 America's angriest dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, that's the guy you do not want to meet if you're, you know, young Matt Cohen going in to meet your girlfriend's parents. You guys are also good together. I mean, uh, you know, tip of the cap to Amy and Matt. Your your guys' chemistry on screen is fantastic, and I and, and I know that's kind of a bit of a crapshoot. You know what I mean? Like you get cast because you're right for the roles, and you can be individually perfect for the roles. But that that thing that happens on screen either works or it doesn't. It's either forced or it's not. And from an outsider's point of view, it looked incredibly natural and organic between you two from the get go. It really does. A, it, yeah, it's a great point, Rich. I mean, and and I, I had a, a thought when. When Amy and Mitch are working with Jensen in the case where they both show up as priests and everything, it was almost, it was refreshing, Amy, to have the female badass energy working hand to hand with, with, with Jensen. And I was like, this, 
this is a show right here. This is a show I want to watch as well, you know? So, uh, all of you and, and Matt, you're just, you're a dream boat and, uh, you embody yeah, that role so great. well. It's, it's so it's, fun to watch that episode. Uh, what a, yeah. knowing your guys' origin story as characters was really fascinating. And, and I mean, like my friend, Amy, my friend, Matt, how you guys started in this universe specifically, because I've known you, I knew you as people before I knew you, who you were on the show and to go back and watch it and go, Oh man, duh. Cause you're so good as those characters. You know, you're so good as the original versions of those characters, even though you played them second, you're the original versions. Cause you're going back in time to do it. And you just do such a lovely job. Both of you. Thank you. Thank you. It was, I think, I mean, I don't know if I can speak for you, Matt, but it was just so fun. Like I always talk about when I'm asked about my experience on Supernatural, I think in so many ways it spoiled me. It, there really isn't, I, I have yet to experience another show that is just all around so positive and inclusive and fun and, um, I really don't have anything negative to say about the experience. And I think that that's rare. It is. It is indeed. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank I, you guys for coming and do this, man. This is so awesome to have you and you'll be back because we're going to have you back for your other episodes, but thanks guys. Come, come back yes, and see us too. again. Hey, this is Jeffrey Dean Morgan. We are going to take a quick break. Hey, it's Jeffrey D. Morgan again. Welcome back to the podcast. Well, that was great. Great to see them. Great to talk to them. We don't get two actors on this podcast yeah. together very often. That was really cool. Yeah. My favorite is when you said, uh, for those of you not watching, because that's pretty much everybody. <laughs> I forgot. My, my favorite was, my favorite uh, thing you said was when you looked looked at Matt in shock and said, was your hole really that big? For some I knew reason, I knew you were holding <laughs> things back when I said that. I couldn't said, help it. Yeah, I saw <laughs> your your wires in your head go zzz, 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 or too many uh, bits that you could have said there. Um, but I kept it classy, didn't I, Robert? <laughs> oh God! Well, let's get right into mythology, shall we? Mythology, mythology, mythology. Drinking demon's blood has varied effects depending on different lore or uses in fiction. In Dungeons and Dragons, for example, a number of things can happen. Some are neutral things, like, ooh, I just drank demon's blood, however, nothing's happening to me. Some are even positive. Hey, I drank this demon's blood and I've got wings now. Yes, it causes you to grow wings. And others are really, really awful, like your arms and legs switching places, your head doubling in size, or your weight tripling. Maybe that explains my weight gain. (laughs) <laughs> Too much demon's blood. Oh, and and your big head. Yeah. Um. I, you know, as much as you f- flubble with words, every time I have one little thing that I have in interviews, you're like, hold on a minute. What? <laughs> what are, was that? You said, and you texted me my yours flub are funnier. Up. Yours are funnier. Because you, 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 you're really good at when you flub, making it hilarious. Like bunny oh, bonding. That was I great. go on as if I didn't flub because I'm a professional. <laughs> and you're like, hold on, time out. Because it's so funny. Look, I I wish I had the gift you give to people, the joy you bring them through laughter. I'm just over here on the bench watching had, the professionals play. I honestly spent the first half of the interview wondering if they knew who I was. Like, that's how much <laughs> I've been scarred from this, this podcast. Oh, man. Uh, in the video game Dragon Age, the drinker gets the ability to sense demons and hear the horde in their dreams. Robbie, you're a drinker. Have you ever uh, sensed demons or hear, heard a horde? Nearly every time. <laughs> in the Conan mythology, uh, I'm assuming O'Brien. O'Brien. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is used to enhance blasphemous magic and rituals. Yeah, that's definitely O'Brien. <laughs> the Demon Blood Recipe from Season 2, Episode 21 of the podcast. Here it is. For Demon's Blood... You take one shot of peppermint schnapps, one shot of 151 proof rum, six ounces of Mountain Dew, and two ounces of cherry Kool-Aid. Is that always how you say Mountain Dew? Mountain Dew? Dew. <laughs> you know what, Robert? I'm looking at this and I'm going, this is one of the few like cocktail recipes where I don't have any of those ingredients in my home. Uh, hey, you ready for some fun facts? Fun facts! Fun facts! Fun facts! Fun facts! 
The title of the episode comes from the first line in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Huh, didn't realize that. It's also the title of a Journey album from 1980. I didn't realize that either, did you? Must be, must be back when Greg Raleigh was in the band. Ah, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Early, sure. before yeah. Escape. Real early. Um, Deanna is the name of Eric Kripke's wife. Hey! Oh, Grandma. Matt Cohen starred in Boogeyman 2, as we mentioned, which is the sequel to the first produced feature film written by Eric Kripke. Which was called what? Boogeyman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How did you figure... Wow. Yeah, that's just... That's, that's all up here, man. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Born Holy with You're it. an encyclopedia. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Rob Encyclopedia Dict. Um, oops. The song Ramblin' Man by the Allman Brothers playing in the jukebox in the diner came out in August of 1973. Somebody in music screwed up and well, shall be fired. Or maybe the diner got a hold of the demo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe Greg Allman or Dwayne Allman were working as a short order cook, brought in their demo 45. Right. Or maybe they used uh, Napster. They used Napster. <laughs> yeah, and the episode takes place in April 73. So Ramblin' Man was also featured in the pilot. Dean, <laughs> Dean is driving around in a 1980 Ford Pinto. All those se- seem like an unrelated fact. <laughs> They're one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> and Castiel's in the kitchen. <laughs> I was watching you try to string it together as one coherent thought. It can't be done. It can't be done. Um, and so I want to I, I, like, I, I wanted to say one thing about this that is I, I have one flaw. Found one flaw in the episode. I want to talk about it. Can we talk about it? Rich's flaw. Flaw. Are we to believe that Dean is the reason why dad drives that car? Meaning if Dean doesn't go back in time in that episode, if Cassio doesn't send Dean back, does uh-huh. dad buy a van? Because, you know, he was supposed to not change the future, but he changed it by suggesting the car. Yeah. By intervening and saying, hey, don't get that van. He literally steered him to something else that becomes part of the lore of the show. Yeah. But it's only the lore of the show because Dean steered Dad that direction. So if if this episode never takes place, if Castiel never se- sends Dean back, is the whole show Sam and Dean driving around in a van? Seriously, good. like that seems like a, an no, odd. Good. Yeah, detail. and I feel like I don't know. And that in the last episode, of season five, and there's like they talk about the lore of Baby, and I don't remember how if they talk about when he bought it or what shape it was in or whatever. But yeah, we'll I don't find know. Out, I guess I don't know. Anyway, that, that's my one flaw. That's Richard's flaw sequence. Although it is the moment I realized that when he bought the car, because of the year and make of that car, it would have been a used car at that yeah. time. Yeah, true. Still an old car. And is there anything to the fact that the the VW he was going to buy is like the VW that they drive in the Winchester spinoff? I, I wonder that myself. If Mary goes, because Mary has the van in the Winchester spinoff. I think it's her yeah. van, right? Right. I, I don't know if there's a, a tie in there or not. It's got to be. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing I do know. May 2nd is the day Mary makes her deal with Azazel. It is Sam's birthday, the date Dean traded his soul for Sam's life, and the day Dean died and went to hell. May 2nd is also International Scurvy Awareness Day, <laughs> and also Dean is driving around in a 1984 Pinto. <laughs> I was going to say... <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Carl had a sandwich. Um, yeah, dude. <laughs> International Scurvy Awareness Day. Oh. oh, man. Boy. Which, obviously, the writers knew. Yeah, duh. Um, if you look closely at Mary Winchester, which Rob certainly did, but mm-hmm. her charm bracelet, it has a men of letters charm. Ooh. Mm. Talk about, like, eye on the future. Mm-hmm. All right, let's talk about the Back to the Future references. Going to go back in time. Going to back in time. Go ahead, Rob. Obviously, the diner scene. Tell me, doctor, where are we going this time? (laughs) And then there's the line, angels got their hands on some DeLoreans. Is it the 50s or 1999? (laughs) The person Azazel poses as is named Dr. Brown. All I want to do Play my guitar and sing. And the tab reference. So take me away. I don't mind. It's something, something, something back in time. time. Hey, by the way, 
how gross was Tab? Do you remember drinking oh, yeah. Tab? My mom would drink Tab. It was like the Diet Coke of the day. And, oh, God, it tasted like motor like oil. A, like bad Dr. Pepper. Yeah. I didn't know the Dr. Brown thing. I missed that his name was Dr. Brown. I, I was just too. I was just kind of confused because he kind of looks like the actor who plays Yellow Eyed Demon. I know. It was trippy because I, I was like, oh, did they. Is it supposed to be him? Right. It threw me off. Yeah. Well, wow. What an episode. I'll tell you, it's going to be a great season, Rich. It's going to be a great season. Yeah. I'm embarrassed by our previous work in seasons one, two, and three. This uh, is the season. Look, it's we couldn't have had this season without those. You know what I mean? Anyway, everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll see you the next one. Yeah, we will. This episode of Supernatural featured Jared Padalecki, Jensen Ackles, and Misha Collins. In the Beginning was written by Jeremy Carver and directed by Steve Boyum. Guest stars included Mitch Pileggi, Matt Cohen, Amy Gumanick, Allison Hosek, and Christopher B. McCabe. The episode was edited by Tom McQuaid, music by Christopher Leonards. It was executive produced by Eric Kripke and Robert Singer. It featured the songs Ramblin' Man by the Allman Brothers Band. Go For Yourself by Kenny Smith and the Love Leaders. And One More Day by, again, Kenny Smith and the Love Leaders. This episode originally aired on October 2nd, 2008. This episode of Supernatural Then and I was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spade Jr. and Rob Benedict. Produced by Stephen Hine, written by Stephen Hine and Hayda Holsher. And edited and associate produced by Trey Booty. Right there, buddy! Music provided by Tim Wynn. The episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. This podcast is from Story Mill Media. Follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at SPN Then and Now. And become a member of the podcast at worldwideweb.patreon.com slash SPN then and now. That's www.patreon.com slash SPN then and now. Or if you're born this century, just patreon.com slash SPN then and now. And with a tap on Dean's form, with a tap, and with a tap on Dean's forehead, Castiel sends him back to 1973. Did you almost say foreskin? It sounded like you were going to say with a tap on Dean's foreskin. Not at all. (laughs) Nope. We don't get two people, two actors on the interview uh, uh, box very often. Is this an interview box? That was super funny, Rob. Story Bell Media. 